Shamid Chakrabarti in a report on racism and anti-Semitism in the Labour Party said, and I'm quoting, that surely it is better to use the modern universal language of human rights, be it of discrimination, segregation, occupation or persecution. So why do we insist that Zionism is a useful category with which to understand what is happening in Palestine and Israel today? I would give this analogy, uh, it's, it's quite a simple one. In the case of apartheid in South Africa, would anyone say that we should solely have concentrated on people's human rights, the inevitable discrimination and so on, but not said anything about the system, the ideology of apartheid? I, I think most people would say that, that is ridiculous, that you cannot separate the two. And so the same is true of the state of Israel that Zionism is the ideology which underpins everything that takes place in it. So the segregation, the fact that people live in separate spheres by and large, that education is separate, but also the very concepts that are used in Israel, the idea of redeeming the land, redemption, which in essence means that once Zionist organizations acquired that land, it was never to be released or Arabs were never to be allowed access to that land. So there are a whole number of racist and apartheid ideas which are bound up in Zionism itself. And the second thing about Zionism is it isn't a Jewish ideology. Uh, there is this belief that being Zionist and being Jewish are interchangeable. In the words of the chief rabbi, you would no more separate off the city of London from uh, Britain than you would Zionism from being Jewish. But of course, that is not correct. Uh, the, the first Zionists were not Jewish, they were Christians. I mean, going back to Cromwell, 300 years or so. Uh, but in the 19th century, Zionism became very fashionable ideology, not amongst Jews. When Zionism arose amongst Jews, uh, it was met with fierce hostility. But uh, amongst Christian imperialists, Lord Shaftesbury, Lord Palmerston, George Eliot with her novel, Daniel Deronda, uh, Disraeli, there were many others, uh, Napoleon, Ernest Laharan, the secretary to Napoleon III, they were all Zionists. And the reason why was quite simple, that if you wanted a, a settler state near or adjacent to the Suez Canal, the strategic route then to India, then it, having a Jewish state with the biblical justification was very useful. But uh, Zionism itself uh, amongst Jewish people really did not take off uh, till uh, around 1880, 1881, after the assassination of Alexander II, uh, the Tsar of Russia. Uh, and a consequence of that assassination was a, a wave of pogroms beginning in Odessa in 1881, and this is really when uh, Zionism took off because Zionism was a reaction, and there's no doubt uh, that Zionism was a reaction to anti-Semitism, but it was not uh, the typical uh, reaction, uh, which was to form uh, in many places self-defense squads to fight off the pogromists. On the contrary, Zionism from the very start accepted the basic argument of the uh, anti-Semites, which was basically that uh, Jews were a separate nation. They were, could not assimilate or integrate into the nations amongst whom they lived. And it was better off that uh, the country was better off if they were no longer part of it. And the Zionists accepted that. And it, it, this was not un unique amongst all oppressed peoples. The same happened in the United States with Marcus Garvey and the Back to Africa uh, movement. The, uh, the racists said you're different and the, the victims or some of them said, yes, we are different. Uh, we can't live together. And what we need to do is to uh, form a separate state. In, in the case of Garvey, I mean, uh, you went so far as to establish links with the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and I, 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 I read recently uh, a statement that he, he said of the KKK that they had lynched racial pride into the Negro. So, I mean, these ideas were fairly common. Zionism was amongst it. And 
uh, if I could work from Jacob Klatskin, who was an early Zionist, he edited uh, the Zionist newspaper developed at 1909 to 11, and he was a co-founder of the Encyclopedia Judaica. Uh, he said, if we do not admit the rightfulness of anti-Semitism, we deny the rightfulness of our own nationalism. Instead, and I go on, instead of establishing societies for defense against the anti-Semites who want to reduce our rights, we should establish societies for defense against our friends who desire to defend our rights. So that's in many ways uh, symbolized uh, the, the attitude of, of Zionism. Uh, uh, the founder of the first, uh, the founder of uh, political Zionism was a man called Theodor Herzl. And Theodor Herzl uh, adopted very much the same. He, he was a Viennese journalist and he was their correspondent in Paris. Uh, and he founded the World Zionist Organization, or the Zionist Organization, at a congress in Baal in 1897. Uh, and there's a quite interesting story. The, the, the first congress was supposed to be in Munich, in Germany. The only problem is that the local Jewish population rose up in protest and demanded that it be moved. They said, this is a form of anti-Semitism. You want us to go, and that's why you're holding this congress here. I, I could give another, uh, amongst many examples, when Theodor Herzl, uh, he traveled around Europe trying to win over the ruling classes in various countries uh, to the ideas of Zionism, that the Jews should move to Palestine. And he met the Pope, he met Victor Emmanuel, the King of Hungary, he met the Kaiser uh, of Germany, and he also met, amongst others, the Grand Duke of Baden, who was the uncle of the Kaiser. I, I, and he was uh, discussing it and, it, and the Grand Duke of Barton said to him that, uh, uh, I fully support you, I just have one reservation. If I come out publicly in your support, people will accuse me of anti-Semitism. And that, that, that was the feeling at the time, if you supported Zionism, uh, then you were an anti-Semite because you wanted to be rid of the Jews. And that's, I think, interesting when it comes to the Labour Party today. Mm -hmm when uh, the, uh, the argument is if you oppose Zionism, if you have anything critical to say about Israel, then you must be anti-Semitic. Historically, it was the case that if you were a supporter of Zionism, then the chances are you were also anti-Semitic. And enough, actually, if you look at that today, that is still the same. If you look at who are the best friends of Zionism today, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, who won a general election, on the basis of a campaign against George Soros, the world Jewish financier who was pulling the strings, or Donald Trump, uh, it, the ideas that he put to he won a, uh, an election in 2016 using a whole number of uh, anti-Semitic tropes, including three Jewish bankers on a famous poster uh, with a star of David attached to them. Uh, more recently, he, he told the Hanukkah celebration to uh, Jews uh, in the White House, that Israel was your country. And he, he's repeated that consistently, that Jews should be loyal to Israel because that is their real home. Indeed, when he was, uh, when he was telling three, four black Congress women that they should go back home, he, he added for good measure uh, that they were anti-Semites because of course they hated uh, Israel. As I say, the founder of Zionism was Theodor Herzl, and he, Chris, can I share the screen, do you think, Chris? Oh, uh, yes, go on. Yeah. I wanted to... Uh, I don't know whether anyone can see it now or not. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, Kevin. Well, is it black? Yeah, I can't see anything, but... Uh, No, I think we better. Uh, there it is. Yes, can people see that now? No. Yes, now. <laughs> okay, this is an extract from uh, the completed di complete diaries of Theodore Herzl. And there are four volumes of them, and this is uh, on page six. And then he said, "In Paris, then I gained a freer attitude towards anti-Semitism." Let me put this in context. This was at the time. This is was written. Uh, at the time of the Dreyfus affair 
it was the major anti-Semitic uh, incident, if you like, affair in Europe. It lasted, what, nearly 10 years uh, between uh, the conviction and uh, the eventual acquittal uh, of uh, Dreyfus. And what was uh, the conclusion of Herzog, who, who I say was a correspondent for a Viennese newspaper? In Paris then I gained a freer attitude towards anti-Semitism, which I now began to understand historically and make allowances for. Above all, I recognize the emptiness and futility of attempts to combat anti-Semitism. And that, that is one of the main things, uh, that Zionism starts from the belief that you can, cannot actually fight anti-Semitism. You have to accept it because it's inherent in every non-Jew, in every Jew, uh, Gentile. And in Britain, uh, Sir Samuel Montague, who was the MP for Whitechapel, uh, 1885 to 1900, who was one of the leaders of uh, the Anglo-Jewish community, uh, argued or put forward, and I say it's as true today as it was uh, then, that is it not a suspicious fact that those who have no love for the Jews and those who are pronounced anti-Semites all seem to welcome the Zionist proposals and aspirations. And of course, that is, that is true, that uh, almost invariably, if someone is an anti-Semite, they will be a Zionist, because uh, what, where, what better way of being rid of your unwanted Jews than sending them to Israel? I want to concentrate, uh, Tina, can you give me uh, some notice, five minutes notice of when my time is up, as it were? Sure, another so, 10 minutes. Another 10 minutes, okay, fine. Well, one of the aspects of Zionism which I want to touch on uh, is its attitude to emancipation. Zionism represented a rejection of Jewish emancipation. If you remember, the first country which emancipated the Jews was France in the French Revolution in 1789. The very famous saying from, I think it was Count Stanislas de Tonnerre, I, I can never pronounce it, uh, when he said, to the Jews as a nation, nothing, but to the Jews as an individuals, everything. And Zionism rejected that. And it rejected that for a very simple reason. But it saw that once the gates of emancipation, once emancipation had opened the gates of the ghetto, once the Jews became free to mix and to assimilate, they would disappear as a nation. And, and Zionism above all is a movement of Jewish supremacy that sees as the ultimate goal, the establishment of a Jewish racial state. Emancipation was a direct threat to it. And that's why Zionists uh, forever uh, saw in anti-Semitism something that was good. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a few quotes, uh, starting with Theodor Herzl, because he was the major, major figure. And he, I'll give you three quotes. He said, anti-Semitism, probably contains the divine will to good. Why? Because it forces us to close ranks, unites us through pressure, and through our unity will make us free. And he also said of it, it will not harm the Jews. That's anti-Semitism, mind you. I consider it to be a movement useful to the Jewish character. It represents the education of a group by the masses. Education is accomplished by hard knocks. And that can be found in his founding pamphlet called The Jewish State or De Judenstadt. And he also went on to say, we ought to be thankful to our oppressors that they closed the gates of assimilation to us and took care that our people were concentrated and not dispersed. And that was the attitude. And that was not only the attitude of Herzl to the anti-Semites. And if I had more time, I would explain that Herzl, as I say, traveled around Europe. One of his last journeys was to, to the Russian, uh, the ministers of the Russian Tsar, Count von Plev and Count von Wheat. Plev had organized the Black Hundreds, uh, a, a group of uh, anti Semites, uh, a gang of anti Semites, who had perpetrated many a massacre, including the famous Kishinev pogrom in 1905, 1903, sorry. Three months later, Herzl was meeting with von Plev 
uh, in Russia, promising that the Zionist movement would do nothing to criticize the Tsarist government in exchange for their support. So what happened in Russia uh, when any revolutionary, any socialist, any liberal organization was outlawed, the Zionist movement almost alone was legalized. And her, when uh, Herzl started trying to convert or persuade von Plev, he said, you do not need to preach to me. You are preaching to a convert. Uh, and the Jewish revolutionaries, the Bund, which was a large Jewish organization at the time in Russia, was absolutely outraged, as were most Jewish workers, uh, because Herzl was parleying with a person who was the most hated symbol of all. But that, that was in the early part of the century. But of course, people say uh, to each other, people say, well, the Jews have always wanted to uh, go to Palestine. Zionism has been integral to uh, being Jewish throughout the centuries. And uh, all I have to say is that's absolutely nonsense. In fact, uh, Palestine, because there was nothing to stop Jews going to Palestine, they didn't need a passport, there were no borders, people could quite freely emigrate. Uh, when when the Jews of Russia responded to the pogroms by emigration and between the middle of the 19th century uh, and the First World War, approximately two and a half million Jews emigrated. Where did they emigrate? Not to Palestine, but to the United States. And some of them stopped off at Britain and got no further, 150,000 or so. Probably 1% at best went to uh, uh, move to Palestine. So that just goes to show that Given the choice, Jews will go anywhere but Israel today or Palestine. Uh, the idea that it's somehow the natural home of anyone who is Jewish is an anti-Semitic concept above all. But the Zionists, I mean, uh, I don't have time, of course, to go into the history of the Zionist relationship uh, during the 1930s with the Nazis. It's uh, clearly a controversial topic. Just to say this, there was nothing different in the Zionist reaction to the rise of the Nazis and Hitler than their reaction to anti-Semitism historically. It was on a par. Of course, they didn't foresee the Holocaust. One won't lay that at their feet. But their reaction, for instance, in opposition to the boycott of Nazi Germany, who asked the Jewish masses overwhelmingly, that included the Zionist rank and file, supported a boycott of uh, Nazi Germany. The Zionists were busy negotiating Havara, a trade transfer, not in order to save uh, German Jews, it had to be, because it only applied to the richest Jews anyway. You had to have a thousand pounds in capital, which today would be about, I don't know, 50,000 uh, pounds. But because Palestine was operating a policy called selectivity, so only a few Jews could go there anyway. The attitude of Zionists at the time uh, to the rise of the Nazis was actually that it was an extremely good thing. And I'll just quote two people. One was Emma Ludwig, who was a world famous biographer, who expressed the general attitude of the Zionist movement when he said Hitler will be forgotten in a few years, but it will have a beautiful monument in Palestine. You know, the coming of the Nazis was rather a welcome thing. So many of our German Jews were, were caught in the treacherous current between the Syri Silo of assimilation, the charabodis of a nodding acquaintance with Jewish things. Thousands who seemed completely lost to Judaism were brought back to the fold by Hitler. And for that, I am personally very grateful to him. Uh, uh, and just to complete that, the Zionist national poet Chaim Nachman Bialik uh, volunteered that Hitler has perhaps saved German Jewry which was being assimilated into annihilation. Uh, of course, that is extremely ironic given the Holocaust and what happened. Uh, but the Zionists uh, had, had really had no problem. When Arthur Rupin, who was the key figure in Palestine Zionism, who was the director of the Palestine office from 1908 on, onwards, he was the father of land settlement. Uh, when a friend called him an anti-Semite, he responded, I have already established here in my diary that I despise the cancers of Judaism more than does the worst anti-Semite. Uh, and that's to say, was the general attitude of Zionism 
towards anti-Semitism. Zionism rejected the idea of living with non-Jews. It accepted the principles of the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, the most lethal uh, legal uh, instrument uh, that had been known uh, to man as uh, Norman Cohen, who wrote Warrant for Genocide, uh, said. Other things about Zionism, uh, Zionism began really, I mean, let me say that what, why, why should we be, why should we have an understanding of Zionism? Let me say that if the Palestinian Liberation Organization had had a, a true understanding of Zionism, it wouldn't have signed the Oslo Accords. Zionism began from the idea of a land uh, without a people for a people without a land. Zionism never had any intention of negotiating a separate Palestinian state or relinquishing any part of what it calls the Holy Land, Eretz Yisrael. The Oslo Accords were, if you like, a means of buying time, but the Palestinian leadership bought into that. And as a result, uh, probably the worst catastrophe since the Nakba occurred in the early 1990s as a result of that and the formation of a quizzling government uh, in Ramallah. I'll okay, finish. Up now? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'll finish by quoting what Rudolf Berber, Rudolf Berber, for those who do not know, and most people won't have heard of his name, was one of four Jewish people who managed to escape from Auschwitz. And he escaped and reached Slovakia with his fellow, uh, Alfred Wetzler, uh, on April, I think, the 23rd, uh, 1944. And he, he revealed the secret of Auschwitz because Auschwitz was not known until then. Uh, or if it was known, its existence was disregarded. He, he had a photographic memory and copied down into what became the Auschwitz Protocols, the layouts of Auschwitz and what had happened there. And the Auschwitz Protocols were suppressed by the leader or the leadership of Hungarian Zionism, which resulted partly in the catastrophe whereby in the very last stages of the war, half a million Jews nearly went to the gas chambers and he wrote, I am a Jew. In spite of that, indeed because of that, I accused certain Jewish leaders of one of the most ghastly deeds of the war. This group, this small group of Quislings knew what was happening to their brethren in Hitler's gas chambers and bought their own lives with the price of silence. Among them was Dr. Kastner. I was able to give Hungarian Zionist leaders three weeks notice that Eichmann planned to send a million of their Jews to his gas chambers. Kastner went to Eichmann and told him, I know of your plans, spare some Jews of my choice and I shall keep quiet. That uh, essay was uh, from Rudolf Berber, who was an anti-Zionist Jew uh, who went to Israel and promptly moved uh, first to Britain and then to Canada. Thank you very much. That is really only a fragment, but I've, I've tried to cover some of the, the basic concepts of what Zionism is, thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, now we bring in Moshe, our second speaker. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, 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 the Labour Party leader uh, made a commitment uh, regarding what I regard not as a witch hunt, it is really a heresy hunt. Uh, they don't burn us, uh, they uh, excommunicate us. This is, so it is a heresy hunt. And what is typical of a heresy hunt is that those who deny the heresy uh, of uh, uh, those who are excommunicating uh, are accused of heresy themselves. And this uh, has happened to uh, two of the, my colleagues in this panel uh, so, uh, 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 Sir Kier has made a commitment to, I think, to the uh, Board of Jewish Deputies that uh, he will he will penalize people who share a platform with uh, those excommunicated. Uh, 
and and accused by someone uh, of anti-Semitism, of course, fake fake accusation. Uh, that uh, 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 he will uh, also excommunicate those who share a platform with them. I um, uh, uh, I have contempt for this uh, uh, commitment, and I uh, I'm happy to uh, publicly uh, break it. I I'm I'm proud to share. A, 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 a panel with uh, Chris Williamson. Uh, it's the first time I have a sort of direct uh, communication with him. Uh, I've long had a communication with uh, Tony Grimstein. We have often disagreed, but uh, the disagreement has been, I think, very fruitful. So now to the point. Uh, I would like to make it very, very elementary, very simple. Uh, I, I, I don't want to overload you with, with information and quotations. I just want to concentrate on the, the basics. Uh, that is to say, uh, what is Zionism for beginners? Uh, but it is essential that you, that you uh, internalize this, that you uh, really uh, get the, the essence of what Zionism is before you start to uh, have an attitude whether to oppose it or not to oppose it. This is uh, up to your own uh, uh, moral set of values. So uh, to begin with, Zionism is really a, a movement and it is a, a, a movement with many strands. Of course, there are many factions within it, uh, but uh, they all share some core uh, ideology and a core uh, project. So I would like, first of all, to uh, uh, spell out what is the core ideology of Zionism and what is the core project of Zionism. Ideology has two essential uh, ingredients, two essential uh, articles of belief uh, that are, are shared by all strands of, of uh, Zionism. Number one is the totality of all Jews constitute a single nation or a national entity. Uh, this has been questioned and challenged uh, by uh, a lot of people and initially mostly by Jews themselves. Uh, uh, for example, the, as I think uh, Tony mentioned that the Board of Jewish Deputies at the time of the Balfour Declaration uh, rejected this idea vehemently. Uh, it is indeed a, a very questionable uh, 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 article of faith. Uh, the uh, various Jewish communities around the world have uh, only religion or uh, their religious uh, uh, background, uh, heritage, if you like, in common. Not all of them practice Judaism, but uh, uh, this is what they all have in common and nothing else. They don't have a common uh, daily language. They don't have a common culture, a secular culture. Uh, the only thing is, is, is uh, 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 they have in common is religion. Uh, moreover, uh, in order to become a Jew, a non-Jew has to undergo a uh, uh, religious conversion. He has to go to a rabbi, he or she has to go to a rabbi and undergo conversion. This is both necessary and sufficient to become a Jew. Anybody who is not a Jew can become a Jew by religious conversion. Um, uh, and, vice, and, and conversely, a Jew who, who becomes, let's say, a Muslim is no longer a Jew. Actually, uh, uh, the, the laws of Israel, the, the legal system of Israel, uh, uh, is unique in actually defining who is a Jew. And uh, 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 it, uh, cases uh, have appeared before the Israeli court um, of people who were born Jewish, but converted to other religions, and, and they, the court uh, ruled that they are, cannot be considered Jewish. So this doesn't sound to me as a, as a national entity. Usually, I mean, we think of a nation as a secular concept uh, in the modern sense. So uh, 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 a secular concept, people of uh, the same nation can be of various religions. People of the same religion can be of various nations. But uh, 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 Judaism is essentially a religion. The second article of faith of uh, uh, Zionist ideology is that this alleged nation has a, a right, some right to possess the uh, Holy Land, the, the uh, land of Israel, as they call it, or Palestine, as uh, uh, most other people have come to, to call it. The 
arguments produced by uh, uh, for this uh, uh, claim uh, are uh, very dodgy. Uh, uh, they say that the Jews have uh, uh, a long-standing sentimental connection to the Holy Land. Well, that's true, but if you have a sentimental connection to some somebody or something, it doesn't give you the right to possess it, uh, according to normal criteria. Uh, or that uh, very long ago, centuries and centuries ago, there were uh, uh, Jewish kingdoms in that part of the world. Well, yes, so uh, uh, there were uh, 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 Welsh kingdoms in various parts of England. Uh, that doesn't give the Welsh people the right to possess those parts of England. And so for the only uh, uh, argument that you cannot argue with is that God promised this uh, land to the Jews. Well, you can't argue with God, but in, in order for this argument to be uh, compelling, you have to believe in God, not only in a God, but in the God of, of uh, uh, that religion. But apparently, you know, uh, it has been said that in order to be a Zionist, uh, you don't have to believe in God, but you have to believe that God promised the uh, land of Israel to the Jews. Well, this is, it, of course, is, is a paradoxical way of uh, putting it. Okay, so these are, these are the very questionable, essential ideological elements of Zionism. Uh, you cannot be a Zionist without uh, uh, believing in this, uh, these two uh, tenets. Uh, and uh, if you oppose them, then you are anti-Zionist in the ideological sense. But let me go uh, now on to the uh, practical aspect of it. It is uh, Zionism is a project, not only an ideology, but a project. And the, the, the project follows from the ideology. Basically, uh, Zionism is the, a project of colonizing Palestine uh, in order to convert it to a majority uh, Jewish state. Um, the term colonization I use not as a, as a, a, a kind of vituperation or, or a, a, a expletive. It is the way the Zionist movement described itself. I will uh, put in the, uh, uh, in the chat um, uh, let me see. I, I, I would like to put a, a, a I would like sorry, uh, someone was calling me on the phone. I would like to put uh, on the chat a link to a, an article which is uh, uh, regarded as a, a, an essential uh, uh, document of, of Zionism. It was written by uh, Vladimir Jabotinsky in 1923, and uh, it, it, it makes it clear uh, that uh, uh, Zionism, as far as he was concerned, and as far as the, the, the Zionists that, that were uh, with whom he was, he was uh, discussing this, was a, a, a colonizing movement. It is about colonization. Here it is. Yes, I think, yeah, yeah, I think you have a, uh, um, we can also put it out uh, when, with the video, so don't worry about it too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, no, I, I just want to make sure that you got the link. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yes, uh, to continue, uh, to say that it is a colonizing project is not sufficient because there have been colonizations of various types. And it is very important to uh, understand what type of colonization, Zionist colonization it has been and is continues to be. Uh, 
unlike other types of uh, uh, colonization, it was not aimed at exploiting the labor power of the indigenous people. It, from the beginning, it uh, 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 assumed correctly that in order to get a, a Jewish majority state in Palestine, it would be uh, uh, wrong to try to, ex to make use of the uh, labor power of the indigenous people because the, the direct producers in every society are the majority. Um, and this is a, a, a clear difference, a clear distinction between, for example, the type of uh, Zionist uh, colonization that Zionism undertook and what uh, took place in South Africa. In South Africa, the South African economy under apartheid depended on the labor power of the indigenous people. Uh, uh, they, they would be set apart. Apartheid was based on, on uh, separation, but not complete separation. Separation in social and political terms, but not in economic terms. The indigenous people were essential, were necessary for the uh, uh, apartheid regime. The Zionist type of colonization is in a sense more apartheid than the original South African apartheid, because from the point of, of view of Zionism, uh, uh, the, the indigenous population are surplus to requirement. And Zionist colonization is therefore similar to other places where uh, the colonizers did not make use of the labor power of the indigenous people, but were themselves direct producers. They displaced the indigenous population rather than uh, try to expel them. This is essential to uh, uh, understand the, the nature of uh, the project of Zionism and the Israeli state, which is both a product and an instrument of this project of colonization. So uh, um, I would say that this is the basic thing that you have to understand uh, about uh, the Zionist project, that it is a project of colonization and it is a project of colonization of the basic type that uh, aims not to exploit the indigenous people as far as possible, but to displace them. Uh, and the type of racism that uh, uh, this project is accompanied with is typical of uh, uh, that type of colonization. Um, there are various types of racism. Racism is not one thing. There are all, it comes in, in, in all varieties and shades. And especially in the case of, of uh, colonizations and settler states, the type of uh, racism uh, depends on what type of colonization it is. Uh, the, uh, if you look, for example, at the, at the United States, there were two distinct types of racism that have been and, 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 and lingering uh, in, in that uh, uh, country. There was a, a, a racism directed against the people who were exploited as slaves. Now, in order to justify this uh, exploitation, the uh, black people, the uh, pl slaves imported from Africa and, and exploited horribly, uh, were uh, de described as inferior people, as, as uh, somehow uh, uh, primitive human beings, not, uh, not on the same intellectual and, and moral level as, as their uh, uh, owners. On the other hand, the uh, racism towards the indigenous uh, Native Americans who were not exploited as, as uh, uh, labor, was quite different. They were regarded as dangerous, wild, uh, if you like, noble savages. They were not, uh, uh, towards them, the kind of racism that, that was applied was not of the same kind as towards the, the uh, exploited uh, slaves. So uh, you have to understand this in order to understand the type of racism that Zionist colonization is accompanying, because the racism is normally an ideology and practice that is, is, is serves to justify uh, colonization, exploitation, wherever it exists, and, and uh, other types of oppression. And therefore, I would say also, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, 
uh, take definition of antisemitism or one of the uh, um, examples that is given accompanying it uh, forbids or defines an anti-Semitic any comparison of uh, uh, Zionist practices in the state of Israel, the, the laws of Israel and the practices with uh, what was uh, uh, current in, in Nazi Germany. You're not allowed to make this comparison. Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, this comparison is not anti-Semitic, it is simply not to the point. The true comparison is, uh, I, I, I think we should make, is not between uh, the uh, laws and practices of Israel and that of Nazi Germany, but the practices of uh, the Zionist uh, uh, regime of Israel with other colonialist enterprises of a similar nature. So you make the comparison, is uh, 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 Zionist colonization, is the racist uh, practices as bad as uh, Britain's practices in Tasmania. No, no, they're not as bad. Zionism is less, less horrible than what the British did in Tasmania. Is it as bad as, uh, uh, or as good as what happened in the relatively most, the relatively most benign case that of New Zealand? No, Zionism is worse than the colonization of New Zealand. I think this is the kind of comparison that, that you should make. It is a, a rather, similar on the same level as the, the uh, uh, crimes uh, uh, committed by uh, uh, colonizers of North America uh, against the indigenous uh, uh, Native American po population. I think this is the kind of comparison that makes sense. Um, now, uh, uh, although uh, Zionist colonization is of a type, that I mentioned similar to uh, what took place in, in North America, in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, not so much in South Africa where uh, there was a, a different uh, form of colonization. Uh, nevertheless, it has some um, unique and exceptional features. The most obvious exceptional feature of uh, Zionist colonization is its anachronistic nature. All other similar forms of colonization were over and done with by the, the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the native populations had been uh, uh, marginalized, exterminated, ethnically cleansed, or, or uh, uh, otherwise similarly dealt with. Zionist colonization is, is exceptional in that it is still ongoing. It is uh, 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 different from other similar types of colonization as a, 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 an active volcano is different from extinct volcanoes. So it is ongoing. It is, it is not something that happened in the past. It is something that is continuing. And, and if you look at the practices of the state of Israel, you see it in action. The, the state of Israel, as I said before, is not only a product of Zionist colonization, it is also a political instrument for perpetuating it and continuing it. It, it is a, an instrument for the Zionist equivalent uh, of what in North America was uh, uh, the, the, the project of uh, manifest destiny, which claimed that the, the, the white settlers had the, the manifest destiny to colonize the whole of the American uh, North con continent from sea to shining sea. Um, another exceptional feature of Zionism is, is the following. Whereas other similar forms of colonization were uh, sponsored by a, an empire that sent its own citizens, its own people to colonize the various parts of the world. I mean, as in Australia, uh, as in North America, as in New Zealand, as in Tasmania. In the case of Zionism, uh, the settlers had no uh, uh, mother empire, had no mother metropolis who sent them. They needed a surrogate mother. And the surrogate mother initially was the British Empire. So, uh, and, and on from then, throughout the history of Zionist colonization, Zionism needed the sponsorship of a surrogate mother empire. Uh, and it made a Faustian deal 
with all those empires, beginning with the uh, British Empire, briefly with the uh, uh, French uh, uh, colonial uh, empire, and uh, laterally and currently with the American imperialism. Uh, and that is, uh, we, and this was actually foreshadowed by Herzl, I think uh, Tony may have mentioned it, Herzl actually devised this strategy. Um, we uh, will be a bastion against uh, uh, the, the native, natives of Asia on behalf, and at that time he, he said uh, uh, Europe, he meant European imperialism. He didn't think of American imperialism at, at that time because it wasn't really on the map. Um, and, and this has persisted. Zionism and the Zionist regime of Israel is an essential and important uh, ally of whichever uh, imperialism is hegemonic in the region and in the world. Uh, and uh, this role of the Zionist regime is not only a local one, but uh, has become a more uh, global uh, 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 role of Israel as a junior partner of uh, American imperialist hegemony of, of the world. And hence you can see that the close relationship between uh, Netanyahu and, and uh, Trump. And this is only a personal expression of something which is much deeper and which is, I mean, if there is a special relationship of any uh, country with the United States, it's not poor uh, declining Britain, but uh, the, the uh, Israeli uh, watchdog of imperialism. Okay, so this is my uh, uh, short primer of what Zionism is. Why should we oppose it? Well, this uh, is uh, the conclusion of what I am saying. Uh, it, it is, first of all, if you are an anti-imperialist, if you uh, reject imperialist domi uh, domination and hegemony, uh, anywhere in the world, and especially in the uh, region of the Middle East, then you should oppose the main uh, uh, junior partner of uh, imperialism in that area. So this is, this is number one. Uh, Anti-Zionism is a necessary consequence of anti-imperialism. The second one reverts to the nature of uh, Zionism itself, what it is not vis-a-vis uh, uh, the world, but what we what it is vis a vis its its colonial victims. You should re reject and oppose Zionism because the Zionist regime is an institutionalized armed robbery of Palestinian land. I repeat, the Zionist regime is an institutionalized armed robbery of Palestinian land. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moshe, I could imagine you might be hearing <laughs> from an institution linked to the Labour Party soon, but I mean, exactly, exactly. If we don't fight um, a back against attempts to rule out and delegitimize uh, uh, anti-Zionism, then, you know, there's a question mark over what we're, what we're doing in the Labour movement and uh, wider than that. Comrades, please put your questions, um, ideally raise your hand, the blue hand, if you have questions, I would like to make a contribution. Lots of issues been brought up in this session and very, very good uh, session uh, by, by, by Moshe in particular. Tony was good as well, of course, but Moshe has a very excellent way of, <laughs> of structuring his openings, um, which, was, which was fascinating. So comrades, if you have questions, contributions, please raise your hand or alternatively, put your questions in the Q&A. Could I ask the two panelists to look at the Q&A and also choose if you perhaps would like to respond to some, some of these issues raised in the Q&A uh, in, in, in the meeting. So I'm bringing in first Paul Collins, who oh, I should have made a panelist earlier. Um, please switch on your camera and switch on your um, microphone and then we can see and hear you. Uh, hello. Hello, hold on, where are you? Can you, can you hear me? See you. There you are, excellent. Hello. Um, hi there. Um, I, I enjoyed that. That was very good. Um, 
I was surprised how little I knew about the history of it. Um, I was particularly surprised about Tony's contribution with regards to the history of um, what makes an anti-Semite an anti-Semite, as it were, because if you look if you look at today with the Labour Party, um, you'd, you'd have the impression that the, the situation is completely reversed. Um, my question is, um, I don't really know how to put it. Is it, is it possible to be um, an anti-Zionist without actually calling for the state of Israel to be abolished? In other words, to go back to the United Nations 1967 borders um, and leave it at that. Supposing you didn't feel very strong on it, but you still supported the right of Israel to exist. Um, does that make you a Zionist? If, I hope that makes sense. Um, yes, I, I leave it at that. Um, but, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, the other thing I was going to mention, when you look at Jewish Voice for Labour and uh, what they say about um, Jews and um, Zionism, or, um, you often find that if you post an article from them um, uh, to, you know, a lot of uh, Labour members on the right will say, uh, they don't speak for um, all Jews, and uh, um, so you end up in this um, what you might call the wrong type of Jew without saying it as such. And uh, I often, um, perhaps um, one of the panel could answer whether that is actually a, a form of anti-Semitism in itself. Um, yes, thanks for that. I leave it there. Thank you, comrade. Um, Tony Moshe, do you want to answer straight away or shall I bring in somebody else first? It's up to you. I, I mean, you are, you are the chair. I mean, I, 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 I'll bring in one more question. Um, Steve, who is um, from the US, I believe. Hello, yes. Steve. Hi, um, thanks for having this presentation. Um, I think one of the things that has to be addressed around the issue of of Zionism and the role of Zionism in the labor movement uh, is the um, the uh, role it plays in organizing uh, against uh, critics of Israel and against the Zionist ideology. Because in the United States, the AFL-CIO, of course, supports Israel and actually has a Zionist ideology. And this prevents a debate and discussion in the labor movement about the role of Israel and Zionism. So I don't think we can and this has been an historic issue in the United States that people who are critical now uh, of Zionism are being accused of being anti-Semites and is used politically. So I think, and I think the same thing has happened in Britain. There was an organized campaign <clears throat> to get rid of uh, critics of Israel uh, who were anti-Zionist saying that they were anti-Semitic. So I think there has to be a campaign in the labor movement in the unions, both in the United States and Britain and around the world and Canada as well, that the fight against Zionism is a fight against a racist ideology. And also that the, uh, the premise of the U.S. unions are equality for all, uh, secular equality, the rights of all workers. And the reality is when you support a Zionist regime, you're supporting a discrimination against non-Jews, uh, of course, Palestinians. So I think there has to be a, a kind of a political campaign internationally around those issues in the working class, in the labor movement, uh, ideologically. Thank you, Steve. Totally agree, um, which is why Labor Against the Witch Hunt is also involved in trying to set up a, an international campaign uh, to defend free speech. We'll get in touch with you about this because this is an, a part of an attack that is going on on other issues as well. And it's in all countries. Um, if, and I'm hoping, hoping maybe the, the panelists could uh, touch on that when they come back, where this renewed attempt, because it's, it's a relatively, it's a relatively new uh, modern attempt to um, delegitimize um, criticizing Zionism. And uh, I believe it's 
Moshe has been saying before, is linked to the war on uh, Iraq. And when, when Germany, for example, wouldn't follow suit very well and opposed, opposed going to war. And we had a, a, a movement called the Anti-Deutsche, which is a very unpleasant uh, movement, which, which tried to, which started to, to label any criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. And that has spread, I, th I thought they were just really, really strange, but that has spread very much across, across uh, other countries as well. And the labeling of the BDS movement as anti-Semitic, et cetera, comes, comes from that as well. So Moshe wants to answer some of these. Yes, I, uh, I would like to answer three questions, two of which were uh, voiced uh, here. Um, on Zoom, and the, the other one was on, uh, on questions, uh, on the questions and answers uh, panel. Uh, does uh, anti-Zionism uh, uh, imply uh, opposition to the state of Israel as such? I, I think, you know, this, this uh, uh, is, is akin to the uh, uh, trap question. Um, are you against the right of Israel to exist? And if you are an anti-Zionist, they expect you to, to, to either, either fumble or, uh, um, or give the wrong answer. Well, in my view, no state has a right to exist as such. I mean, the right to exist is, is a human right. And it is not about the, uh, for me, not about the existence of the state of Israel, but about the Zionist regime. Uh, what uh, I and my comrades have been advocating uh, for uh, the last uh, many decades uh, since uh, the organization that I helped to found, Matspen, was founded in 1962, almost since the very beginning, what we advocated was the overthrow of the Zionist regime. So it is not just that we are against uh, the uh, present Israeli government. It is not, on the other hand, that we are against uh, the right of the state of Israel to exist uh, as, as a, some exception. We are uh, against any uh, right of any state to exist. It, it, it is not something, something God-given. Uh, no state has a, a God-given right to exist. But this is, not, this is not the question. The question is the question of the regime. What uh, we are advocating is uh, uh, the... Uh, overthrow of the Zionist regime of the state of Israel. This brings me to another question that was uh, uh, raised by a comrade, I think, uh, Guy Saha, on, on the question and answer, which made the analogy with South Africa. Uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, the comparison uh, uh, is not very optimistic uh, for uh, uh, people like us who are uh, against the uh, Zionist colonization uh, enterprise. Uh, the, it is very often assumed that the South African apartheid regime was overthrown by international uh, uh, public uh, pressure. This is only true to a very partial extent. The thing about uh, the apartheid regime what contributed mostly to its downfall, the international pressure played a role, and I, it is undeniable that it helped. But in that case, what uh, uh, clinched the, the, the case was, first of all, the uh, military defeat of the South African regime in, in Angola and in uh, uh, Southwest Africa. But more than that, it was the fact that the regime could not uh, deal with the majority of the population because at that, uh, in, under that regime, as I pointed out, the majority of the population were oppressed, exploited, but at the same time, it, essential for the existing uh, regime. It was, the, they were its labor, but he couldn't get rid of them. Uh, the uh, case of Zionism is, is different. Uh, the uh, Zionist colonization regime has an option, unfortunately, which the South African apartheid regime did not have. And that is 
another major uh, Nakba, another major expulsion, uh, uh, exiling of the uh, remaining Palestinian people in, in uh, uh, between the, uh, the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. This is always a danger. And so I think what we uh, uh, should mobilize uh, public opinion for is to be ready and prepared to oppose that impending danger because uh, it is clear that the Zionist regime did not uh, ever seriously uh, uh, accept the idea of two states. Uh, this was a deception. Uh, uh, it is interested in one state, one state under Zionist control, but there it has a problem of uh, the, uh, at least half of the population being uh, non-Jewish, being uh, mainly Arab. And uh, the uh, resolution of that uh, contradiction from the point of view of the Zionist regime is to use any possible opportunity, any uh, 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 opportune uh, uh, hour, as it is called in Zionist uh, discourse, to get rid of as many Palestinians as, as possible. I think we should uh, be prepared for this uh, uh, to be attempted whenever there is a, an international crisis. I'm not speaking purely in a speculative form. There are known plans, uh, least, not least by uh, uh, a previous Israeli Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, and the existing one, the present one, Benjamin Netanyahu, of getting rid, actually expelling a major part of the Palestinian population. So this is, this is the, the uh, 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 kind of mobilization that we should uh, be uh, seriously engaged in to mobilize public opinion against the uh, danger of uh, another major expulsion of the Palestinian people. Finally, it is true, as a, a, a comrade uh, Steve has pointed out from the United States, that, that Zionism serves to mobilize uh, the working class and generally public opinion uh, in support of uh, uh, imperialism. And this is really the secret of what this huge campaign against, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the Labour Party, against uh, Jeremy Corbyn, and against uh, uh, those who supported him, um, on the false accusations of anti-Semitism. It is a mistake to suppose that this is purely the work of the uh, uh, Israel advocacy groups, mm -hmm. the so-called uh, pro-Israel lobby such as uh, uh, we, we stand by Israel, the, uh, the Jewish labor movement, which is committed to advocate for Israel and, and uh, uh, board of uh, deputies of British Jews, which is constitutionally committed to advocate for Israel. It is not purely they who are responsible for this campaign. They provide the, uh, the theme. I mean, if they didn't uh, uh, participate in accusations of anti-Semitism, nobody would take it seriously. Uh, but the, the main, let us say, energy and the main drive comes from the establishment, from the pro-imperialist establishment within the Labour Party and uh, 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 those parts of the Labour Party that are loyal to the, the British establishment and the British establishment itself outside the uh, uh, Labour Party. The, uh, uh, which it includes the, uh, the mainstream media, the, the BBC, uh, and, and the, the uh, press, the, the prejudice press that we have here, including the, uh, uh, the hypocritical so-called left-wing uh, guardian. This is it. It, it, it is it, it is they who are who are really. Uh, the main driving force of this campaign against uh, uh, the Labour Party uh, uh, under the, the guise of uh, accusations of anti-Semitism, which are false, by the way. Uh, the, the, the way you can see that they are false and, and, and really exaggerated is that they don't 
give any quantification. They don't take this, they make the impression that this, uh, the Labour Party is riddled with anti-Semitism, however defined, it's badly defined, by the way. But the better is, the question is not only of definition, it's also quantification. Uh, uh, any reasonable uh, uh, accusation should be accompanied by quantification. How many anti-Semites are there in Labour? Are there more anti-Semites than pedophiles? Are there more anti-Semites in the Labour Party than white beaters? Are, are there more anti-Semites in the Labour Party than in the Conservative Party? They don't actually give you these data. I mean, are there uh, hundreds of anti-Semites or, or uh, 100,000? They, they avoid this question. And this is a hallmark of a false accusation. If it doesn't give you, if it makes vague accusation without actually quanti quantifying it, that is a, 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 a hallmark of a lie. Right, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Moshe, quite right. Um, John McDonald just yeah. said the other day at a rally that it doesn't matter how many <laughs> cases there were, what mattered is how bad the Jewish people felt, which uh, he's next for the chop anyway, so <laughs> that's another matter. Tony. Yes, John McDonnell is beyond uh, hope, I think. Uh, we just have to really have pity for him. But uh, if I can follow up from what Moshe said, I think one of the most su surprising and striking things about the anti-Semitism witch hunt is that there are actually no victims of this anti-Semitism. Anti the Labour Party is overridden with anti-Semitism. There are anti-Semites everywhere, but the only victim that I know of anti-Semitism, if anyone watched the BBC panorama, is Labour anti-Semitic. The only victim was the person who came on first. You remember Ella Rose, who if there was any justice in this world, she would be nominated for an Oscar for her performance, which was truly magnificent. But apart from that, uh, there are no victims. And the same with the, the, IA, with the H, the Equality Human Rights Commission's report. It accuses two people, Pam Bromley and Ken Livingston, of being guilty of harassment. But it's a very strange legal definition of harassment, which actually doesn't have a named victim. It's simply a generic quality. In reality, of course, the anti-Semitism witch hunt uh, is not about anti-Semitism. In fact, I'll go further. It's based on the, the idea that all Jews support Zionism and therefore if you're anti-Zionist, you're anti-Semitic. Well, that in itself is a racist, anti-Semitic idea. So uh, the, un the witch hunt is actually inevitably inherently uh, racist. Uh, and it's no wonder that not only Jewish people, but of course, many black and many Muslim people are the victims of it. But we also just, uh, I, I think you have to look if you're sensible. When has the right of the Labour Party ever been bothered about racism? When has Tom Watson, Tom Watson uh, ran the election, by-election campaign in 2004 in Birmingham, Hodge Hill. It, the campaign consisted of demonising asylum seekers and saying that the Liberal Democrats were soft on asylum seekers. I mean, this is the man who defended uh, the uh, racist Labour MP, Phil Woolis, in 2010, who had written who had run a, an election campaign based on making the white folks angry. You might remember the High Court removed him for lying from uh, the House of Parliament. And uh, Tom Watson wrote how upset he'd lost sleep apparently over this case. I mean, the idea that these right wingers are concerned about anti-Semitism really is uh, for the birds. But it's very, very useful in providing a moral legitimacy to the campaign to overthrow Corbyn. Quite simply, uh, when Corbyn was elected and he, he was seen as someone who was anti-NATO, anti-war and so on. I mean, the alarm bells, I'm sure, rang from uh, Langley in Virginia, the CIA headquarters, to the uh, Israeli army's headquarters in Tel Aviv, stopping off uh, in London at MI5 headquarters as well. Uh, and, and clearly the anti-Semitism narrative, and it developed, it took some time to develop, uh, was seen as the most useful weapon that they could deploy. And, uh, and really, that is what it is. So you do, you, I mean, you, we learned that 25 Jewish people were uh, currently suspended or under investigation. I mean, 
what kind of campaign against anti-Semitism is it that targets to a large extent Jewish people? It's a nonsense uh, because of course we are the wrong sort of Jews. As regards the question of if you're an anti-Zionist, can you be opposed to the state of Israel? I think, yes, if, if you're talking about Israel as a Jewish supremacist state, then clearly you can't be an anti-Zionist if you support its existence, even within uh, the 1967 borders. You're opposed to the, the fundamental nature uh, of a state that is based on one section of the population. Israel is a state uh, of the Jews. It's a state of uh, its Jewish citizens in practice, not all of its citizens. And that's why in every peace negotiation, one of the first things they propose is a land swap uh with the future palestinian entity in which they can transfer the major concentrations of uh, palestinian israelis inside israel the triangle in particular over to a new fledgling uh, palestinian state palestinians in israel of which there are 20 percent are really tolerated guests i mean although they have citizenship it's a citizenship that is almost meaningless in terms of their rights and the jewish nation state law is a uh, put that down uh, in uh, concrete, as it were. So uh, the answer is, if you're an anti-Zionist, you believe in a secular state, uh, a state that doesn't depend on one particular ethnicity. Although, of course, very useful, just like in Ireland and South Africa, to have a section of the population which identifies with that state based on that ethnicity makes it extremely hard to overthrow. And South Africa was difficult enough but overthrowing Zionism in Israel, I think, will be that much harder because of the support it has garnered. And the fact that really, I mean, the reason why anti-Semitism uh, has such a play morally is, of course, because of the Holocaust. Israel trades on the Holocaust and the memory of the Holocaust. We all know that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, this is, of course, also linked to uh, the question by Neil Hunt, which I quite quickly uh, answer myself. Why do you think the arguments made against the Labour Party about being anti-Semitic had such solid traction in the media, of course, because it suited the media. <laughs> it's entirely dishonest. That was the uh, the way to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn, who is not was not liked by the uh, right wing media either. Uh, they tried different things, didn't they? They tried uh, the Czech spy. They tried a few other things. None of it worked. And then they, they found the, the anti-Semitism um, issue. And that, that it was the issue that Jeremy Corbyn didn't manage to just bat away. Had he done it, we would be in a very different situation today, I believe. Um, OK, we've got um, the next speakers, uh, 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 two comrades from Israel, joining us from Israel. That's Leah and Jakob. Thank you very Welcome. much for joining us. I'm going to spotlight you now. Hello. OK. Hi, well, uh, thanks very much. I mean, I am glad to salute uh, Moshik. Um, uh, as a, a pair of old timers, we became anti Zionist. I mean, I grew up in Israel. Um, I came there as a Zionist, as a youth uh, in my teenage years. Uh, but uh, I became an anti Zionist. Uh, before the 67 war. Thanks to him. To uh, thanks to Moshik, uh, where we met at uh, Jabra's uh, house in Haifa. Mm -hmm. And um, and what I'm glad to say is that although we were a very small handful of people that uh, constituted Matspen, and many of you may be familiar with that, but if you are not, not there is plenty of history about Matspen that is available uh, on YouTube. And uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that the influence on the Israeli politics, in particularly in the left, in the real left, has been enormous, well beyond the the, the small number of members of Matspen at the time. And what one thing that I can say, I mean, the, the, this ghost about anti-Semitism, because anybody that is against the politics of Israel, it's willed it as an anti-Semite. Well, I can tell you, I'm not an anti-Semite. I don't hate myself. I don't think my wife does that. And uh, neither my children, which were grown, which were born there. And uh, when, when they throw this issue about anti-Semitism, I say, well, if this is the only thing that you have to say 
in defense of the politics of Israel, really we are a long step ahead of you. Because, I mean, they have no arguments I mean, about the issues of racism, about passing laws that are continuously, basically it's like a, 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 a state of two, of one people and, this, and, the, and the ones that we need to get rid of, so-called. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is ongoing. I mean, it's not new. It didn't start in 1967. Uh, and it goes way back to Second World War and the establishment of the country. Um, I mean, I, uh, like Moshik and, and others, uh, have been living in the US now for over 40 years. And I can tell you this comes up time and time again. And my, my answer to that is, well, if anti-Semitism is the only thing you have to say about that, the, the concept of being a, a, a solid, democratic, secular, and hopefully socialist state, then you know, we have no argument. That's all that you can say. I mean, that's, that's all your defense. <laughs> Thank you, comrade. Um, bring in a couple of more. Uh, Neil. Todd, please. Ah, good um, morning, uh, comrades. I, I should apologize if I'm a little bit co incoherent. I'm calling you from Australia. Um, okay. Thanks to COVID, I'm uh, stuck here. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, thanks again to the, uh, all the speakers. That was an excellent contributions. Um, uh, I have a longstanding interest in the issue. My father served in Palestine at the end of the British mandate and uh, actually in the height of volunteers. He, one of the very last to leave uh, Haifa uh, and was, of course, a witness to the ethnic cleansing of Haifa and many other atrocities that were carried out by the Zionist terrorist gangs that were carrying out the ethnic cleansing. But my, I, I could go on about that for a long time, but my question really is a practical one. Uh, back in the UK, um, I, like many others, I was a victim of the, the witch hunt. Um, uh, one of the items of evidence that I received um, in my uh, you know, questioning document was a warning that I made to Comrade some months ago, uh, actually a couple of years ago, of infiltration within the Labour Party of, I, I call them David Collier style Zionist trollers. I think everyone knows who the kind of people I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, some of these individuals, and this is in the West Country, are pretty unpleasant people. They're basically fanatical Zionists and they, they're linked to all the people you expect, David Collier, Jonathan Hoffman, um, and many other unpleasant far-right individuals. Um, uh, and uh, my approach to, to dealing with them myself has been to basically a bit like how one would deal with fascists, because that, as far as I can see practically that's what they are. Um, they, you know, I, I, going back to the days when I was in anti-fascist action in the 1980s and so on, uh, and my approach has been to them is basically to name and shame and publicize them to, to show their links to these uh, other far right people. So yeah, my, I, I would like to hear from the panelists. Um, uh, yeah, some yeah, practical quiz questions about combating Zionism now for today, combating these really unpleasant individuals who, you know, pride themselves in trolling other people publicly and, and, sh and smearing uh, them you know, claims of anti-Semitism. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, also have, a, if, if Tony and Moshe could continue to look at the Q&A because there's just too many to read them all out. All right, yeah. um, one question uh, perhaps is, um, it seems there's more and more young people opposing uh, Zionism in, in Israel and going on the streets and uh, etc. Is that is that of a qualitative nature that could make a real difference? Um, that's one question. Uh, okay, but if you could, if you could look what yeah. Steve is now asking as well, and then perhaps answer some of these questions on on screen. Thank you. Hello, Steve. Oh. Fire Sorry. away. Uh, who are you speaking to, Tina? You. <laughs> Oh Steve. right, okay. I was <laughs> sorry. I don't. I, Cause I think I'm a bit. Of, I'm not sorry. But I just say I'm on my phone, so I was having a little bit of a problem with finding okay. my. Way. Are you live now? And I completely lost the picture. So anyway, first thing I want to say was I missed uh, Tony's part of the talk. And then he came in. I didn't realize this meeting was on. And when I found out, I joined it. So unfortunately, I missed what Tony had to say. I only got in a half part of, uh, of, of what Moshe had to say. But it seems to me that if 
if we're arguing that uh, Zionism is a racist ideology, and we know that there's a lot of Zionism in the Labour Party, then in a sense, the Labour Party is a racist party. Uh, that's that's a logical conclusion. Of that, and you can't fight racism in the Labour Party if you're not going to take on the ideas of Zionism. And that's the problem I think that we've got. But obviously, that requires us to think a lot about Israel, which is what with what's happening here. So I really want to. My point was, if you compare South Africa with an America, New Zealand, Australia, all colonial settler states that Moshe mentioned in, in his part of his talk, at some point, at, at some stage, at, you, you're going to accept they exist. I mean, we're not trying to abolish South Africa, America, New Zealand, or Australia. We kind of accept their existence. Now, you could argue that Israel is different because Israel is still an expansionist mm -hmm. state. It's still, it, its colonization hasn't finished, whereas the other ones, their colonization finished. But at somewhere down the track, somewhere historically, a colonial state becomes a stable state. And you don't try to abolish it, you try to democratize it in a certain sense, which is what happened in South Africa. I mean, it was a, a, a um, the democratization of South Africa that took place. So you, so you might say Israel is different because of its expansionist nature. It hasn't stopped its expansionism. But there might be an argument for saying that the problem that we've got is that the argument is if you accept that Israel exists, then the argument is against Israel as a Zionist state, not as a democratic state. In other words, is it possible for Israel to be democratized and for its link with Zionism to be broken? And if you're going to do that, you're going to need the 20% of the Arab population of Israel to be part of that process, obviously, because they're the victims of a Zionist Israel. Now, I know Tony doesn't agree with this, but I just think we go over the argument. Do we have to get rid of Israel or can it be, is there some point where it can be democratized? In other words, you can have a democratic process, which would include, of course, recognizing the right of a Palestinian state to exist. I do, you know, without doing that. So is there a program that says we're against the Zionist Israel because it's racist, but we want to see a democratic Israel? And the only way that can come about is if the working class and the Arab populations transform the state from the nature of the state that it is. So, I want to just ask whether that is a possible way. It's a different approach on it. I know Tony's yeah, not going to yeah. agree with it, but you know, I'd just like to throw that into the equation. Moshe, I think is, well, we'll say what Moshe says. <laughs> um, just before I bring the two speakers in, we had a I couple- can, I can speak for myself. <laughs> but a couple more comments in uh, the live YouTube um, channel from Chris, um, just two, points there um making a, some uh, one one person asks um there is he heard there's a, there's discrimination against non-jewish citizen when they're trying to purchase or own land um which is disputed apparently by zionists that that exists perhaps you you know anything more about that um and then also has has if it has evolved how has zionism evolved over the last few years um has there been a change um, obviously, I guess there has been a change in, in the, in the anti-Semitism campaign, the smear campaign, but has there been any other changes? Have there been any other changes that you think are useful? Um, I would have thought you both have about 10 minutes if you want to answer a few questions and use the opportunity now to sum up. Um, who would like to go first? Let's do Tony first. Okay. I've drawn, drawn a short straw. Uh, can Israel, in essence, be normalised? Is really what you're saying, Steve Freeman? Uh, would that be correct? No, he's disappeared Oops, now. I just made him. Yes, he did. <laughs> Democratic. Uh, that's what I took. I took to it, be his argument. Firstly, I don't even think the United States and Australia have been normalised. I think part of the behaviour of the United States and its attitude, both to its own, to black people, uh, and of course, indigenous people, uh, as well as its adventures abroad, are partly shaped by its settler colonial origins. And the same is true of Australia. It has never come to terms with its Aboriginal population. But Israel is an active settler colonial state, not only in the occupied territories, but internally. It's continue, you know, there's a continuous program of Judaization in the Negev, in the Galilee, uh, uh, to restrict the expansion of existing 
Israeli-Palestinian towns and villages. Uh, it, it's Zionism as an ideology, which is quite unlike most, uh, certainly Australia and United States don't have that ideology now, but the ideology of making the state more Jewish at the expense of those who are non-Jewish, even though they are citizens, formally at least, it, it is pretty unique to Israel. But Israel is an active colonial power. And I was thinking about the, the question of expansion, because that, that was part of one of the questions which was raised. Were, originally, the Zionist program was based on a, a concept known as the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael. And that goes up to the Litani in uh, Lebanon and across the Euphrates and down to, I think it's the brook of the Nile uh, in the Bible. So there's actually plenty of, uh, plenty of space uh, left to conquer. But in practice, what would happen, supposing that it, it, Israel managed to uh, transfer, expel its Palestinian population? And so its natural border was the Jordan River. Uh, which it populated with settlers. I have no doubt at all whatsoever. It would then come into conflict with uh, Jordan and there would be some pretext in the, or other in order to start raiding uh, Jordan and then other neighboring countries. So Israel is potentially is still an expansionist state. It's not a state which I think will ever be normalized uh, because of its situation in the Middle East as much as anything else. The question is, how you overthrow the Zionist regime. And I don't think that's possible by the Palestinians themselves. Uh, other questions, uh, one was uh, in the, I'm having a look at the questions of an and answers, Tom O'Connor. Do the panelists draw similarities be between Israel, the whites in South Africa during apartheid and unionists in North Ireland? Undoubtedly so. The development of the British mandate from about 1922 onwards uh, almost paralleled the developments in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and it was uh, Ronald Storr, the first military governor of Jerusalem, who said that uh, the Zionist settlement was a, a little oil roster in a sea of hostile pan-Arabism. Uh, certainly the British understood that in all sorts of ways. Remember, I mean, Balfour, Arthur Balfour, who who initiated the Bal or signed the Balfour Declaration, first saw active service as the chief secretary in Ireland, where he was known as Bloody Balfour, owing to the fact that uh, British troops shot three demonstrators dead in Mitchellstown, uh, County Cork. He was a seasoned imperialist before he ever heard of Zionism. Uh, and of course, he transferred his practices in Ireland. He came over here he became prime minister and then foreign secretary and to him certainly uh, the Zionist settlement was a continuation of uh, the Irish plantation in a way it was it was a new Ulster in the Middle East a strategic ally uh, which was uh, of use so yes there were similarly in South Africa I mean there were differences South Africa as Moshe said exploited black labor it didn't try to exclude it but many of the myths in South Africa were much the same. And one of the major myths is that the black, that white South Africans didn't displace black South Africans because the black South Africans came to South Africa as a result of uh, the industrialization, the provision of employment on the cotton fields and in the wine and so on. Uh, but it was an empty land before the settlers came. That was also, of course, that one of the myths of the Zionists, which was untrue, of course. Uh, uh, I don't know what other information on the UK Israel lobby. Well, there's BICOM is the main Israel lobby, but there are many, many other players. And we can, I think, now include the Community Security Trust and the campaign against anti-Semitism. Uh, an anonymous attendee has said, it was directed in motion, but I'll also like to answer. Do you believe in one state or two states? I am firmly opposed to two states. I'm firmly opposed to partition, whether it's in Ireland or whether it's in uh, Palestine. I mean, as James Connolly said in Ireland, partition would create a carnival of reaction on both sides of the border. That would be the case if there was a two state solution in Palestine. In reality, why would you want to have a two-state? What, why, what is it that prevents Jews and or Israelis and Palestinians living together? I, I can't see any argument 
other than the racist argument, which says that Palestinians and Jews cannot cohabit together. Uh, that is part of the myth of the settler colonialism. So uh, I, I firmly, uh, I firmly reject the idea, and I am in favour of a secular democratic state. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. Okay, Moshe, please, for about ten minutes. Thank you. Yes, well, I'll, I'll uh, go through some of the questions in, in uh, order. Uh, Neil asks how to combat this attack of uh, fake accusations of anti-Semitism. Well, uh, I said so, you know, years ago, uh, and I published an article under the uh, title, Don't Apologize, Attack. Mm -hmm. We, I think it is a cardinal strategic mistake to try to apologize. Yes, there is anti-Semitism. Of course, you know, there, there are uh, uh, pedophiliacs in, in the Labour Party. But uh, uh, if the Labour Party has been accused of being rife with pedophilia, then you know that it is a fake accusation. It is not, it, 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 it is not serious. There is no that there are no numbers attached to this, as, as I pointed out before. So don't apologize, attack. Uh, there, is there a radicalization in Israel? I, I, I want to mention something that you may, you, most people who don't follow the Israeli press are not aware of. Since the middle of July, there has been a, you, a, a no enormous wage, huge wage of uh, uh, demonstrations in Israel. You hear about demonstrations in Kazakhstan, you hear about demonstrations in, in Tajikistan, you hear the demonstrations in, in, uh, uh, in the Ukraine, you hear about, uh, 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 what is it, uh, uh, in Thailand, but there, is, there seems to be an embargo about news uh, which Israelis feel as the biggest wave of demonstrations, they've been persistent and huge. Uh, they try to suppress this uh, wave of demonstration because of the, the uh, uh, corona uh, uh, crisis, but uh, the, the, all they manage is to make, uh, in, instead of one huge demonstration, the uh, peak was 10,000 people, a, a, a lot of small demonstrations. Unfortunately, I mean, they are not uh, uh, left wing as such. I mean, the, 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 the uh, more, the, the uh, let us say, what can be described as the left of Israeli politics has not become stronger in this demonstration, nor have they become we weaker. Uh, if anything, uh, they uh, uh, signal some drift from uh, the Likud of Netanyahu to more right-wing uh, parties. But the, 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 thrust, the thrust of these demonstrations is against the huge corruption that has been revealed and, and the, the ineptitude of the regime to uh, deal with the uh, corona crisis. This is not reported at all. There is a conspiracy of silence in the, the, the British press about this. They report from Israel, they report all sorts of trivialities. They report uh, 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 little gossip uh, things, but they don't report about this, some, something that Israelis sense as, as the, uh, uh, an enormous wave of demonstration, the most important since, you know, since the, the great seamen strike in the, in the early 1950s. Uh, can can uh, uh, Israel uh, change? I don't think this is a, a, a possible in the short term. I think uh, Tony is, is too uh, pessimistic in uh, uh, intimidate or intimating that it can never change. I don't think, you know, never is, 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 is uh, I think, too strong. If, uh, uh, it cannot uh, change in the, in the short term, and uh, let, let me tell you why. It, there, there are few laws in history, but one of the actual laws of history is that whenever there is a colonization of the type that uh, Zionism represents, that is to say, uh, colonization based on the uh, labor power of the settlers themselves, a new nation comes into existence. There is a, a, an Australian nation, an, a, an American nation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There, there is also a, a, an Israeli a Hebrew nation, as I would call it, because it is it, it, this is what it used to call itself uh, until shortly after 1948. 
and it is uh, 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 characterized by its everyday language, which is unique to us. It is the Hebrew language. Um, this this uh, 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 nation has its own working class. As Tony rightly said, the working class in Israel uh, does not support the uh, overthrow of the Zionist regime at the moment. It is an exploited class, but it has a privilege as a, an exploited class of a privileged nation. I think that uh, without the participation of this working class, Zionism cannot be overthrown. But at the moment, uh, and in the uh, near future, there is no reason for this working class to overthrow the uh, Zionist regime and lose its privilege of being part of an, a privileged nation without uh, 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 changing its status as an exploited class. This is not, I mean, so from a, an exploited class with national privilege, it it would become an exploited class without national privilege. This is no deal that the Israeli uh, uh, working class is, is, is uh, 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 likely to make. The only context in which the Zionist regime can be overthrown, and it can only be overthrown by its, its own people, by, by the uh, working class, majority of which is, is, is uh, uh, Hebrew, um, in the context of a socialist transformation of the region. This is not likely to happen anytime soon, but we are socialists. We believe in world socialism, and uh, uh, in, in particular in socialism in the, in the uh, region of, of, of the Middle East, of the Arab East. In this situation, the Israeli working class, the Hebrew working class, can be offered a, a deal of exchanging its status as an exploited class of a privileged nation uh, and becoming part of the ruling class of a socialist region and give up its national privileges. This is a deal that uh, uh, can become attractive. It is this context, I, I think, that uh, uh, a, a, a resolution of the problem can, can occur. I think the two-state solution was from the beginning a, 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 a deception. A one-state solution without a, a, a socialist change is, is impossible. What it, uh, uh, the only uh, uh, one-state solution in the, in the foreseeable future is a, the one-state solution in Zionist terms, which means expulsion of a, a huge number of, of additional Palestinians. There is a possibility of integrating the, uh, both, both national groups that exist now in Israel, the uh, uh, Hebrew nation and the Palestinian Arab, uh, uh, part of the Arab nation in a socialist union or federation of the region. This is not going to happen anytime soon. And in this respect, I think Tony is right, but he's not right in my view in saying uh, it is never going to happen. It's like saying socialism is, is, is never going to happen. And in this case, uh, what are we doing here? Very well summed up. I was thinking that there's a rule of history and that nothing, nothing stays the same. Everything is in flux and it all depends uh, on our forces as well. I would just like to sum up, uh, just right from the beginning of where, where Moshe defined Zionism which I think is very useful for us to get our head around, a, a, a short definition of what Zionism is and why we oppose it. Firstly, you said, ideologically, all, it's based on the belief that all Jews constitute a single nation. This thing, and secondly, this alleged nation has the right to possess the Holy Land, which is very based on dodgy arguments uh, that you can't really argue with because you can't argue with God. And the project of Colo that the project of the Zionists is colonializing Palestine uh, by getting rid and displaced the Arab population. That is, in a nutshell, very very briefly, what Zionism. Zionism I mean, Zionism believed it could solve the Jewish question by forming a separate Jewish state. I mean, that but it's based, weird. and as as, as Moshe described, it is based on racism. It must 
apply racist measures to achieve this level of colonialization, etc. And in that sense, uh, anti-Zionism is anti-racism, it's anti-imperialism, and this is why, why, why we oppose it. In order to fight racism, you need to be an anti-Zionist, simple as that. Tony, you, you look like you want to say something quickly. No, I just said, I mean, I, I don't disagree with any of that. Yes, I mean, <laughs> fundamental to Zionism, yeah. that Jews form a separate nation, which is an anti-Semitic <laughs> concept, uh, that Jews are not part of the nations am amongst which to whom they live. Okay. But, uh, Zionism arose at a time when there was a so-called Jewish question. What was the place of Jews in European society? And its solution, was in essence self repatriation to remove Jews from European society. And that fitted in with what anti Semitism did. So I agree with Moshe. But Zionism today is a movement of Jewish supremacy. Yes, yes, yes indeed. Yes. So it goes, beyond, it goes much beyond about having an Israeli state, which, which is what's, what they want to tell us. Um, you know, we don't believe is Jews should be thrown into the sea, but we also don't believe they have the right to oppress uh, half the population um, on, on racist terms and, uh, and more than that. So um, next steps, we would urge you to, to, to uh, if you want to, um, join Labour Against the Witch Hunt. We have a members meeting on December the 12th. Chris uh, will, of course, urge you, if he was here, he would urge you to join Resistance TV, uh, Resistance Movement. We have a, a, a conference planned and there will be news of that on December the 12th, hoping a, a conference on free speech on Israel-Palestine, which deals with the IRAMIS definition of, of uh, anti-Semitism, as well as the EHRA report, uh, sorry, EHRC report and um, uh, questions of, as we discussed them today, how to fight back against the witch hunt. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, there's been uh, over 150 people in this meeting with another 40 or 50 people watching online on our Facebook channel and many more on Chris Williams. It will be recorded. It's been recorded, hasn't it? It's been recorded. We're putting this out tomorrow as a video as well. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. And we hope uh, we've all learned something tonight. I certainly have. Uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much.